Very well, thanks. Oh, where's oh, your background? Uh, you're recording this? Yeah, just so we can uh, I'm edit it. Just at home. kidding. Ah, uh, you're just you're you're <laughs> such a pain in the butt. You are. <laughs> I know. I, I am a total pain in the butt. Let's see if I can't get more. Sin. I don't know. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. How about you? Well, um, so so how how has uh, COVID been affecting you guys, if anything at all? Um, let me let's see if I can get rid of this. Hold on, let me. I don't need, let me grab my mouse. Ugh. Let's see. Click. Okay. Um, how has? Let me try one other thing real quick, just to be. Uh, Eh, okay, and not much I can do about it. All right, um, COVID. Oh well, COVID's. Well, how do I put this? It's um, we did well. We um, as a company did really well off wow. of it. Though so it was well, you know, it, it's kind of I would imagine a lot of companies yeah. in um, in our industry probably did pretty well. All of a sudden, everybody's stuck at home, right? And so what are you going to do when you're at home? You're going to play with your stereo. Um, and fortunately, we had switched to our, in the United States, to our direct model about, oh gosh, when was it? December or so, uh, before the pandemic. And um, we were lucky in that because we are I would say almost exclusively, well, a third of our com company are engineers. And so when we had to switch everything over to a VPN network, you, you know what that is? Yeah. yeah. So when we had to switch to a VPN for all our employees, because the state mandated that we could only have, oh gosh, what was it? Maybe a third. Uh, we have 53 people. So yeah, that's a lot of people. And only a third of them could show up at the office, like overnight, boom, done. So uh, that was challenging, but our engineers were able to set up uh, VPN networks. We had the entire sales team, customer service team working from home within two days, which a lot of companies, you know, that were are smaller, maybe have one IT guy, um, it, Pretty hard. So, how, but how did that affect the uh, production? Since um, you know, it's one thing that you can work sales can work from home, but production cut. Right. So when we were given the uh, directive to have only one third of the people, our company is basically, if 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 you, if you look at it, we're one third engineers, one third production, warehouse, inventory, and one third uh, uh, admin. So we're sort of broken up into thirds. So the one third that stayed was production, warehousing, and um, uh, you know the people who do all the kidding and uh, all that kind of good stuff. So that went without a hitch. Those boys just put their masks on and uh, knuckled down and started making products. It's just the salespeople couldn't go in, the customer service, and none of the engineers could go in. We had the president of our company, Jim Labe, who is, really runs the place. He was the only admin person there. I mean, that guy, we did three shifts. Um, so we started at about four in the morning and gave everybody like six hour shifts and then they would switch and then another crew would come in. I mean, I uh, my hat's off to Jim. I, I'm, you know me, I'm just a troublemaker. and. Uh, so Jim is like Mr. Organized. He's, he's, you know, he get her done. He, he's, uh, he's a, big picture he's, a he's a Christian cowboy and, uh, he's, you know, a very devout man and just the best person we ever had. He, he's really in many respects between my wife who runs all of HR and, you know, uh, keeps everybody in line and, and Jim Labe and, and, uh, our CFO Keenan, th those three people are really the reason that PS Audio is successful. Uh, I just hang out and take the credit. 
So, 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 so all the notes I just made about giving you all this praise, I can just tear it all up. Because tear it up. Tear it up. I didn't do diddly shit. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't. It was great. I just, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, I mean, the, the hats off to those people. They did it all. I, I was just along for the ride. So, so why don't I start by introducing you? So usually the way our videos work is... Um, when 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 we get together to chat, we just have the cameras just go on and uh -huh. we start taping. And then uh, uh, this way, everybody's comfortable. And then we put the intro in. And so this way, um, um, uh, uh, Angus, who is, who is overseeing and hosting all of this, he'll just put it all together and make okay. us all look good. Is so Ang is Angus the one that's hiding behind the no camera? That's right. That's right. That's right. A Angus, Angus do, you is, have, do you have a face, Angus? What's that? I don't. I, I. I don't get to see Angus. Yeah, he says, Angus. Yeah. Angus is your camera on. Do you want to join us real quick? Let's see if he really exists. He does. He's 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 one of these young, amazing kids who knows everything about everything. Oh, and, don't you love you know, those it makes, guys? It makes you wonder how stupid we were when we were in our twenties, right? Seriously, <laughs> right? You look at you look at. Teenagers. I don't wonder. <laughs> No wonder on my side. Uh, Angus says, I, Angus just texted me. I prefer to stay behind the camera. Uh, He's camera shy. I think okay. he has skeletons in his closet. Yeah. Anyway. He's, um, probably, he's probably butt naked sitting there in his chair <laughs> is what it is. He's All right. doing a tube in. He's doing a tube in from CNN. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak with Paul McGowan, founder and CEO of PS Audio today. If I look like I'm staring at another screen, it's because I am. I scripted everything. Um, I first came across PS Audio in the late 80s. My God, I'm old. When I first heard the 4.6 preamp. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Finally. 4.6 preamp and the 200 CM. I was shocked at how much better it was against the competition like Carver, Counterpoint, Moscow, you remember Moscow? Yeah, Sumo. of course. Harvey Rosenberg. That's right. Sumo, Sony CES, David Nakamichi. Fletcher, yeah. yeah. Most of which are no longer in business. Uh, PS Audio seemed like a combination of the airiness of Mark Levinson with the balls of Krell. So Paul sold PS Audio in the late 90s, and together with his best friend, the late Arnie Nudell, started Genesis Technologies, making some of the finest speakers in the world. Uh, shouldn't be yeah in the in the early nineties not in the late nineties uh, when I heard when I heard that Paul would be coming to Toronto for a meeting I begged my Genesis agent to arrange for Paul to visit sure enough Paul came by and unlike some other founders in our industry that I had met he's exactly as you see him on his videos down to earth kind very intelligent and funny Paul taught and entertained and explained many of the innovations of the Genesis speakers like the shape of the enclosures, the circular ribbon, the power amplifier for the bass drivers, and the revolutionary digital time lens. I still have one, I do. Nice. I don't have the remote though, don't know where it is. <laughs> I, have, thing, I have one, by the way, uh, and I cool. can, and I, if you send me a, a little cheap shit, you know, programmable one, I'll, I'll program it for you. I will, I will. This theme of an educator would continue as you will see. Paul has always been an innovator par excellence. When he brought back, when he bought back PS Audio, one of the first things he released was the original version of Power Regenerator, the Power Plant 300, P300. This took the audio world by storm and won many awards. His company's website started a forum section that allows free and open dialogue. Participants can give their feedback, good and bad. Indeed, I think Paul encourages constructive critique so that the company can learn and do even better. This is so completely different than everybody else in the industry. And you will see Paul interacting as well. He also brought us Copper Magazine and Octave Studios. But perhaps the one attribute I admire most of Paul is educated. From the time that he came to visit and taught me so much about the speakers and electronics to his hundreds of videos on audio, helping hundreds of thousands of music lovers all over the world, get better sound and understand how audio works. He's also written best-selling books, including an autobiography, a book about how to be more fit, and this one, which we are here to discuss, 
Audiophile's guide, the stereo, unlock the secrets to great sound. How to get the most out of your system is, is my paraphrase. You can even order it as a package with a special test reference CD. This is the book and this is the CD. The CD and SACD, which by the way, is really, really good. Thanks. Regular viewers of our YouTube channel know that we match the funds we receive from YouTube and donate them to the Salvation Army. To date, we've received, we've raised about $12,000 wow. and we've donated it all to the Salvation Army. To thank Paul for joining us today, we will be donating $1,000 to the Daily Bread Food Bank. In addition, the Canadian distributor for PS Audio, Don Rule of Kimber Can, has very generously donated a few of the book SACD CD sets. So we have six to give away. Comment on this video, share and like. We will pick six winners. All you have to do is pay for the shipping. Each set is worth 55 US dollars, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. All right. <laughs> I am deeply honored and truly <laughs> delighted to welcome a great designer, innovator, entrepreneur, survivor, and educator, Paul McGowan. Paul, welcome. Wow, what an intro, Adrian. You're in the wrong biz, dude. Took me an hour to try and figure out all the good things to say about it. <laughs> yeah, that would take some digging. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're very kind. Thank you. You're welcome. And I mean every word. I I, I remember vividly uh, when when you and I first met. So I I I had had experience with your equipment, and I was truly blown away by. So my very good friend, uh, Rob, who will be watching this video when, when it goes live, Rob had, I had met him previously, originally, and we started talking and he had the PS4 preamp. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember which amp he had, but then he eventually bought the 200C. And we, we, he would bring over and we would listen and, and we'd compare it to Roland's and all kinds of stuff that we had at the time in the store I was working in. And I was always amazed by how good the stuff was. And then be blown away by the fact that this stuff is very, very inexpensive. And so especially during that time when you could buy good, decent audio equipment for not very much money. And then I got a chance to hear the 4.6 and I was blown away. And then the five. So I had the five and I compared it to the back then very, very expensive class A audio preamplifier. I think it was Try to remember what it was called, DR7 maybe? It was a $10,000 preamp with two huge chassis, big power supply, and I preferred your five. I was really wow. impressed. Yeah, really, really impressed. So, so that was my introduction to your company. And of course, back then there was no internet. So the only thing I could find out about PS Audio was the odd review that I could find from magazines that had done it. And then, um, uh, um, and then, Fast forward, uh, pick, uh, started the company, picked up Genesis because of your involvement along with Arnie. And then you came to town and we were in this very old, small, decrepit industrial unit. And you, you I, I was so afraid that you would you know, go, oh my God, what am I doing at this place? This guy looks like he's gonna be out of business next week. And you said nothing to your credit. Uh, if anything, you were extremely polite, very engaging. Um, talk so much about the Genesis speakers, the background, how you and Arnie got together, the shape of the, the Genesis 3s, you know, that were circular and why, you know, an arch was such a strong form in architecture, yeah. all those yeah. things, the circular ribbon. I was so amazed by how much you guys uh, um, invested in the design and technology of the speakers. So that was my first uh, impression of, of, of you. And, and it was tremendous to your credit no oh, well, thank you adrian that's very kind yeah. is, that was audio excellence yes yeah yes yeah still is yeah. <laughs> thank yeah, god still is. there you go yeah thank, thank god you know we've, we've both been through enough uh a number of, of um uh um, recessions and thank god we're still here yeah well you yeah you probably remember that all the genesis speakers uh it, it, when they were the round cabinets were all built in Toronto. Uh, that's right. That's right. Remember that? Yeah. Howard Hybrid's company, API. That's, that's right. Well, that's why you were here, I guess. That's why I, 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 I showed up. I became quite a, uh, Toronto became very uh, dear to me. It was, I was there every two weeks. 
And uh, I got I've, I've, I found this great place that had uh, they made these crab legs uh, and I would just sit and just woof down these crab legs. I saw I saw Phantom of the Opera. The first oh, yeah. time I ever saw it was in Toronto. Wow. Um, and I, you know, so, yeah, I was just that guy that showed up because I was the interface between Genesis and the factory with uh, Ian Paisley and. Yeah. Um, all the all the cool guy and uh, Gord um, and gosh it brings back a lot of memories yeah great great company um, and I, they sold to somebody I don't know whatever happened to Howard but um, but yeah they were our fifty percent partner in Genesis and they they did all the manufacturing great you know great company yeah I I still remember very fondly the Genesis threes we sold a whole whack of the Genesis twos. And then uh, the Genesis, we sold one pair of Genesis 1s and 1.1s. Well, those, and, and that the 2s and the 1s, now that was after we left API. I thought, I, oh, okay. But yeah, it was so those under- were all made in, yeah. So the ones that started looking like Infinity yes. um, were all made in um, uh, Colorado. So we, we broke with API uh, with all the round speakers. I mean, people just hated the way they looked um i mean we they were great sounding speakers the uh, 5200s the 8300s so i think you probably got in at a time because the three uh, see the gen threes that those are the big tall ones right yeah those were made in colorado so my my apologies originally they, everything was made in, in canada and then, yeah, we did get we did get the smaller ones as well. Yeah, but but the the, the big ones were like scary good. Yeah, scary yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, the big ones were scary good, and the Gen ones were. I in in my memoirs, I talk a lot about how we transitioned from one to the other and building those things. And the this. I also remember the stealth, the integrated end. Yeah, you remember the stealth? That, that was cool. That, that was cool. Good. That was my big project. That was, um, it had a variable class A bias. You could turn the bias up to a hundred percent. So it was fully class A or down to class A, B or anywhere in between. Um, that was a really hard amp to design. That, that was a beast too. That sucker was big. It was. I hated you guys. I swore every time we had to deliver those big speakers because they came in big crates. Oh, it was and, huge. You know, the twos were four chassis with a separate amplifier. And we had to always hire movers to carry everything. And uh, one time we had to go down the flight of stairs and the stairs were really steep. And and the movers almost refused to do it because it was, it was scary. It was actually dangerous. But we got them down. And I think the speakers are still there because I don't think there's any way to move them <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, you know, what, the, the Gen 2s, which were uh, my favorite, I thought they were the, the best that we really, I love the Gen 1s, but the Gen 2s just, I don't know, they just worked. And just recently, a fellow from uh, New Mexico uh, emailed me and he says, I've got a pristine pair of Gen 2s. I'm no longer in a position to have them. I can't, I don't want to sell them. I don't want to deal with anybody. Could you find, I'll give them to for free. I'll give them to anybody who wants them. And I put out a call on our forums and, and he said, the, the deal is they're in my garage. Uh, just find somebody who's willing to drive down here, who will give them a good home. And, and we did. And we found a guy in Washington, the state of Washington. And it's actually, it's on our forum. And you can Very see his cool. pictures of the road trip and getting the U-Haul trailer and and driving down to the guy and packing him up. So he got himself a beautiful pair of speakers for free. Oh, my gosh. I know. Wow. I was really tempted, but oh, well, I got enough stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you, me both. So oh, let's get back to let's get back yeah. to the book. What what prompted you to write this book? I mean, uh, um, there have been other audio self-help sure. books before. Sure. What prompted you to write this book? Well, I mean, the the only really the one that I thought ever had a whole lot of value as a setup book is, of course, Jim Smith's uh, yes. Get Better Sound, which is a great book. And Jim's a great guy. Uh, Bob Harley uh, put out the, you know, the encyclopedia. Um, and it wasn't a self-help book. It was just like, oh, my, you know, this is everything you ever wanted to know answered all your questions. But it so. 
it all goes back to um, our interaction with our customers. So you, you've known me for longer than any, any of us want to admit. Um, and we, me, us, we've always been very customer centric. Um, customers always came directly to us for help, right? And so as an electronics manufacturer, one of our problems has always been connecting it up to loudspeakers because our electronics are judged by how well they sound on someone's system. So if someone has their system set up incorrectly at home and it's it's tweaked to work with their Bryston and their, you know, whatever, uh, and it works pretty well, now I'm going to say, I got, I got something better over here. I'm going to sell you a BHK or I'm going to sell you, you know, whatever. And you're going to put it in and, and we will be judged on how well it sounds in your system. And if your system isn't set up right, then, you know, we get the blame for it. And then we take it back. Uh, and I've always, everywhere I've traveled all over the world, I've been able to walk into people's homes and sit down and in two or three minutes, I'm sure you can do the same thing. I'm sure you've done it a hundred times. You walk in and you go, oh, gosh, oh, can I just, <laughs> just give me five minutes, you know? And they're all, yeah, sure. Uh, and you rearrange the speakers because, you know, I've got a pretty good feel for it now, as I'm sure you do. And they're like, holy shit, this is amazing, you know? And, uh, and it's just, it's set up. It's, it's all set up. And so I thought, well, before I, uh, before I check out, uh, I would love to be able to share some of that. And uh, to be honest, uh, our, uh, the side motivation, you know, that kind of came up for us is you know, we're going to be building speakers. Uh, some, I don't know, we've been talking about this for the last 50,000 years, but honest to God, this, this year they're coming out and, speakers are so set up, as I just mentioned, they're so set up centric that somehow we as a company have to be able to help people set them up properly. And I, I wanted to write a book that was simple. And I also thought that the only way this is ever going to work is to have that companion CD with it. Because I can talk till I'm blue in the face and tell you about the triangle and, you know, move this, move that. All of that's meaningless. It's totally meaningless unless I can say, play this and now you should get that. And if you don't, do this, do this, and then come back to it. And that's the only way it could ever possibly work. So that's, it's a project I've wanted to do forever. And God, we've sold nearly 10,000 books so far yeah and and we're on our fourth printing and our fourth you know purchase of the of the discs and the audio files guide has been uh, just a, a blessing for so many people because of i mean i'm not teaching anything revolutionary here but because of the combination of the disc um and the and and what to do if it's not performing the way it's supposed to like for instance there's one track on there that you know the the, the depth track which is yes. one of my favorites and yeah, three had, six and nine feet yeah three six and nine feet exactly we had our our producers over at octave records they're singers jessica carson and giselle Colazzo, and they're really good singers and they stood and you know we measured it there's pictures of us measuring gusses on the floor you know so stereo microphones three feet away and they start singing da, 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 whatever. And then they move back to six feet and then they move back to nine feet. Well, I don't know any track out there that does that. I mean, to me, that's worth the price of admission right there. It's amazing. You put that on our big system in music room two on the infinity IRS fives and you, you could, you can just, visualize three feet, six feet, nine feet, like, oh, and you put that on most people's systems and it doesn't work. So now, you know, get that right. And then everything else falls into place. So cool. there's a long winded explanation of why I did it. <laughs> so one of the, Sorry, one I'm of just, the, I'm just camera shy, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, um, 
I mean, there was a, one of the great things about the book. I, I was stunned. You cover a lot of topics, like mm-hmm. a lot of topics. And and to your credit, it's it's these are the kinds of questions that people would often want to ask, but sometimes are either afraid to ask because they're shy to mm-hmm. maybe say they don't know, mm-hmm. uh, or dealers don't think about explaining because they're not aware that the client needs to know this. So I really enjoyed that. Um, one of the questions was, um, um, out of all these different topics, how important is the room? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And boy, and that's a tough one because we're all sort of stuck with our rooms, unless for the very few that have the luxury of building their own room. Um, rooms are easily half the problem, if not more. I mean, speaker systems, it's a battle uh, between the room and the system. And the crazy thing is, if you were to take your stereo system and stick it outdoors and set it up on the lawn outside, it sound like dog do. It would be awful because speakers are designed to work within a room, but there's the double-edged sword. Once you get it into the room, now you have, now you got problems. You've got reflections off the walls. If you deaden the room too much, then it it sucks all the life out of it. If it's too live, I mean, on and on and on. And bass, of course, being the the biggest culprit. What most people, or, or not most people, what many people don't realize is the wavelengths involved in low frequencies. I mean, we're talking 50, 60 foot long waves. And unless you've got an extraordinary large room, as soon as you start playing 30 hertz down there, you've got a wavelength that is larger than your room. And what happens to that pressure is it bunches up and then you have you know, 30, 35, 40, you know, and they, they create these things called standing waves. And uh, as you walk up and down in a room playing bass notes, you'll hear uh, dips and bumps. And it's, it's really, and that's part of why we go through, we have uh, our speaker designer, Chris Brunhaver, is standing up on his upright bass and it do, 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 goes up and down so that you can walk back and forth and find the optimum spot. But yeah, rooms play a big deal. Yeah, in the book, you, you gave credit um, to, to I'm trying to remember his name, the gentleman who, who started Sumiko um, in, in, in the yeah. setup. John and, Hunter. That's right. And, yeah. and he used, used to love using that uh, uh, um, that truck, that track. Uh, uh, oh, Famous Brutal, uh, from oh, famous, famous Brutal Raincoat. Uh, yeah, that lady. Arms. But what was that track? Um, it was, and, and, and for years, I, I, I would use that track as well. And to the point where I'm so sick of that song. Yeah. And so it's actually good that this particular track is just a standing bass that goes up and down the, the scale. So you don't get sick of it. It's just, you know, exactly. note played at even volume. So you can hear the uh, standing wave in the room. Yeah, yeah, that's very, very good. Um, now, one of the things that you talked about was what is IAATB? It's all <laughs> about it, it, that base. Base, yes. What what is it that you talk about it and why? With apologies to Megan Trainer. <laughs> <laughs> all about that base. No treble. Um, well, that's one thing I, I learned from John Hunter, uh, who took me back to fun and, and for anybody that's ever had the privilege of watching John Hunter set up a pair of speakers, it it is uh, uh, the last time he did it for us was at the, I think it was the Rocky Mountain show or maybe Expo, one, one of the shows. Um, and the his setup method is, was just stunning. Um, he, he starts with one speaker and he puts it in the room and starts playing that track from Jennifer Warren's and moves it quarters of an inch and just... It's phenomenal just watching him. And it's all about getting the bass correct. That's all he's doing. I mean, no imaging because it's a mono speaker. And then, so anyway, I learned a lot from John. And if you can get the bass right, so if you have a basic setup to where you're kind of got them dialed in, and then you can find a place either by moving the speakers or you 
to where there's a point in the room where you have the best base performance. That also happens to be the best place for imaging, for tonal balance. I mean, it's 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 scary how how uh, how cool that is. And that, uh, it just occurred to me the track is called "The Ballad of the Runaway Horse." Yep, there you go, yeah, Jennifer uh, Warren. You probably were blocking it out of your oh, head. I was trying to think what the hell is it called? And the crazy thing is that the the, the song at no point does it have the lyrics. Ballad of the Runaway Horse. It's just, <laughs> I keep thinking, what the hell is it? Anyway, so yes, I, I agree. That's a very, very good setup uh, methodology. Yeah. Um, what are the aspects in music playback that help you suspend this belief? I mean, you and I have um, had instances where it's not just good, it is unbelievable. It is, it is like everything disappears and it's just the music in you, what the performance in you. Yeah. Have you ever thought about what it is about that particular experience that causes that to happen? Other than, you know, the odd time of, of being a bit high or, you know, <laughs> drunk. <laughs> putting those, <laughs> putting, <laughs> putting those sides away, you know, um, what are some of the things that you think allowed you or allows you to suspend this belief consistently? Yeah. So let me understand your question. Are, are you referring to what is in a recording or what is in a system? Um, Both. I mean, the, the, the times where the experience was so supernatural. Yeah. That, yeah. It's almost always first setup. I, I have heard scary, realistic stereo systems that didn't have great equipment, that had good equipment, but somebody who knew what they were doing in setup. And I've demonstrated it before um, with just mediocre stuff. The really magical moments come when you get set up right and you have the, the good stuff playing the right music. And it's so it's sort of that combination. You know, we, we started this uh, Octave Records which has been a long-term dream of uh, my wife, Terry, and, uh, and me. That goes way back to when the two of us met in Munich, Germany in 1972 or three. And we were aligned with um, Giorgio Moroder, who was, uh, I don't know, it's funny. I ask people, do you know who Giorgio Moroder is? And I'm like, no. Um, eh. Anyway, I, we're all Before good. Before he was Giorgio Moroder. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. I mean, that's exactly right. He had a couple it, it, back then, Giorgio, not to get off onto a tangent, but I do tend to do that. Back then, uh, Giorgio, he's an Italian guy. Uh, he's quite a good musician, plays synth and sings. He had a couple of hits out, kind of minor hits. And he had a recording studio in the, in the basement of the Arabella Hotel called Musicland. And because I was in radio at the time for for AFN, uh, we became kind of good friends. And he used to make what he called his shiza music, his shit music. And it, what, what he would do is make German covers of stuff like Sugar Sugar by the Archies. And, you know, <laughs> so you had these German studio musicians, sugar, sugar, <laughs> well, you know, I, I can't. <laughs> And but that's how he made his living. So this this beautiful 16 track studio, the Studer, everything, he was making shit music and he wanted to make real music. And he had found this lady, Donna Summer, and he wanted to make a star out of her. And in the process, the two of them invented disco, for goodness sake. But anyway, to make uh, a, a long story longer, um, he I was about ready to get out of the army and he said, um, would you consider taking over my Shiza music business and you and Terry, I'll open up another studio. You and Terry run that. And I'm going to take Donna Summer and make her a star. And we said, Oh my God. Yeah. And anyway, that never happened because I got in a little trouble with the army. I, <laughs> I threatened to burn down AFN and the network got a little riled up and they weren't re very appreciative of that. And the next day shipped me off to, to uh, Georgia of all place, you know, oh God. Anyway, uh, so 50 something years later, here we are and we're starting Octave Records. Well, the reason I bring that up is because I have learned in 
the process of, of developing this label with all the people that you know we're working with, how critical the recording process, the mixing process, mastering the whole bit and how much it affects the the sound quality i mean gus skinnis and i are in a constant argument about what the right sound is is it you know our system and is it his it's just it's amazing um and as long as you have electronics and a speaker system that are resolving enough then when you play the right tracks the speakers do what they should do they disappear completely. They're gone. Which, if you look in my music room, I've got seven and a half foot tall giant, you know, beasts in there. And for those things to disappear, it's really quite extraordinary because you're looking at it going, oh my God, I can, you know, and you think that, you know, the sound logically is coming from them, but there is no sound coming from them. It is all behind the loudspeaker. It's on a sound stage by itself. And much of that depends on um, the recording and all the stuff that goes into it. Yeah, I remember the first time I heard the IRS. It's, we drove all the way down to Lyric. Oh yeah, my and, case tour. And yes, and um, you know, just me and my friend, two young, bright-eyed, you know, kids <laughs> who had no business whatsoever, and we had no idea that Mike K had this reputation for you know kicking people out. But that day. We had driven all the way down from Toronto, uh, and 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 Mike was, I guess, really nice and took pity on us, um, and he let us in there and listen to the speakers with wow. the big Goldman reference turntable. Uh, it was it was magical. It was just truly magical. Yeah, yeah. I still remember that sound to this day. Lyric hi-fi back in the day. I I remember being in the room in Lyric and it was packed, and Lenny who um, was, you know, the head guy over there. With, yeah, just retired. He just retired, yeah. And they just closed Lyric, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, Friday night or whatever, and Lenny just, they locked the front door. Had to be 20 people in there. And he said, he just, he's a New Yorker, right? So just bellowed over the, all right, anybody here wants to buy something, you can stay. Everybody else, <laughs> out. <laughs> I thought, whoa, that, you know, that wouldn't have gone over too well in, in uh, back in California. You know, we're, we're nice and polite folk over there. Them New Yorkers are just, you ain't going to buy anything, get out. So, <laughs> but Lyric was an amazing story. Do you remember that ceiling, that wooden ceiling? They, they had this wonderful, curvy, wavy wooden ceiling. I don't know if it was there at the time when you were there. I don't recall. Yeah, I was all, that was the, one of the coolest listening rooms. That was just, yeah, what a treat. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to be mindful of your time. Um, one of the things that I said earlier in my introduction was that I truly respected you for your being an innovator, that you didn't just do what everybody else did. If I think right. about uh, uh, some of the stuff that you've come up with, like, for example, the preamp with the different gain cells, mm -hmm. um, or, for example, in this particular case, the power regeneration. After you bought back PS Audio, I guess right. would have been uh, early 2000s. 1997. Um, and you actually. took control over it. And, yeah, it was 97. 97. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Um, one of the very first products, if not the first product that, that you released at that point was the, the P300, mm -hmm. uh, the power plant. Mm -hmm. And I remember, because I studied in engineering, and I remember thinking, now this is really interesting. <clears throat> Here's a power conditioner that is completely different than how everybody else approaches power conditioners, right? Back then, you used isolation transformers, you used all kinds of uh, MOVs, you used chokes, uh, you know. Uh, which basically choked the life out of odd, you know, power conditioners. And I remember thinking most power conditioners didn't sound all that great. In fact, I generally didn't like them. Mm -hmm. And then here you had this new product that basically said, hey, we're going to take the AC, break it down, make it into DC, and then completely rebuild the sign room. And I thought, genius, right? From that point on, I thought, genius. What, what gave you the idea to come up with that particular product? It was a combination of things. Years ago, Stan had my partner, the, 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 the S of PS Audio, had discovered that when we connected a big transformer, 
to a preamp, the preamp sounded dramatically better. And the bigger the transformer, the better it sounded. I mean, to the point of being ridiculous, we at one point had taken a giant power amp transformer and hooked it up to this little weenie phono stage. And it was, it was just amazing. So we knew the importance of power supply. And what we had figured out over the years is that it's the impedance of the power supply. The lower the impedance of what's feeding the circuit, the better it's going to sound. And the higher the impedance, the worse it's going to sound. And it was it it just took kind of years of, of farting around doing all this stuff to learn that. And, and that became very critical because the easiest way to lower impedance is to build an active regulator, right? So if you if you have a um, an AC source that is regulated, so that regardless of how you know when you instantaneously draw current, it doesn't budge. It's it's it uh, it it has active feedback around it, and it's 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 like damping factor on a power on a power amplifier. We, if we have high damping factor on the output, that means we have extremely low impedance, and it's very much the same as a regulator. So uh, it, I had that in the back of my head. And when we first started getting, oh gosh, the MIT Z stabilizer, and then George Tice's uh, those uh, uh, transformers, <laughs> and and these uh, uh, power conditioners started coming onto the market, we would always hook them up because we always like the new toys. We hook them up and listen to them and think, wow, that's a lot cleaner. And then it's kind of bleached out. It's just lost a lot of the life. And it was the same um, thing I was hearing with those big transformers. The bigger the transformer, the more life that came in. And the smaller the transformer, the more muddled and less life. So all of a sudden, one day, I just put those two things together and said, okay, this makes perfect sense because a power conditioner is adding impedance. You're putting things in series with it, coils, um, cap you know, capacitors are in parallel. But anyway, you're putting things, you know, you're making the line longer and you're making the regulation worse. Because if you take a scope and you put it onto the AC line and you watch as a power amp draw plays music, you can see the music on, on the power line. And the more impedance you put between it, the more you can see it. So I thought, I want to build something that completely gets rid of that problem that lowers the impedance electronically so i because I, I can't afford to to convince people to buy this giant transformer and hook it up to their it's just not it's not going to help not going to work so um my first idea was to actually get a generator an ac generator hook it up to a motor and make a servo system that as the load started changing, the servo would speed up the motor, you know, and give it more current. And that lasted about 10 minutes to where Terry said, you're not putting that in my house. It makes noise, you know. So I thought, oh, I'll do an electronic version. And that's when, bingo, there was the power plant, which is essentially a, a big power amplifier, which has feedback. And we know that, you know, with high damping factor, because you're already regulating whatever you put into the input of a power amp, doesn't, the speaker should not be able to impact the output of that amplifier if it's built properly, which means it's regulated. And then we just took a sine wave generator and have, in fact, I still have it, the old HP sine wave generator. And we would put a, a, a pure sine wave in and the amplifier already is converting AC to DC and then it's sitting there saying, okay, tell me what signal to play. And we just put 60 hertz and I plugged our equipment into it and like, oh my God, this works. And, you know, then I thought, well, this will be trivial to then build something, which <laughs> <laughs> famous, famous last, last word. Yeah. 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 Good luck with that. But anyway, that, so that's how that all happened. Okay. Um, what, if any, are limitations of this technology? Um, well, you can only get so much. Uh, I mean, you can just make it bigger and bigger, I suppose. 
Um, what are the limitations? So the, the, reason I'm ask, the reason I'm asking is um, uh, a, a few videos ago, we had done a, an interview with Garth Powell from AudioQuest. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he, he thinks the world of you in terms of your, your um, innovative capabilities. Yeah. Um, when I asked him, why did you guys choose this technology to do your power conditioners? Um, he explained it. And then I asked him, why not power regeneration? Because in my mind, I'm thinking power regeneration makes all the sense in the world. Sure. And he mentioned one of the issues he thought was that um, for transient power requirements, where suddenly you have big transient, big bass drum, whatever it is, that it may not be capable of producing that uh, capability, that current yeah. uh, and voltage capability. Uh, what do you think of that? He he's absolutely right. And and Garth is a smart guy. I like Garth. Um, one of the problems with AC regeneration is that deliver. How do you deliver in that a much instantaneous current? Because we're talking 70, sometimes 70, 80 amps. And you only got 15 amps out of the wall to start with. And so you need uh, huge amounts of instantaneous current and you need to be able to deliver them seamlessly without changing the voltage at all. So Garth is completely correct. There was a product out, in fact, I think it was made in Canada. Well, oh, I'm trying to, I won't be able to remember what it is now. Um, anyway, getting old. Um, but it was a competing regenerator, and it was based on a, a class D amplifier at the output stage. And a class D amplifier, which we know can put out 1200 watts. I mean, you know, we make a 1200 watt class D amp, right? And it's efficient and it's, it should be perfect. It sucks as a regenerator because of that very problem. It can't deliver that instantaneous current. In order to do that, and I think this is where Garth got, got off, you know, because I know that they tried to build some stuff and I think they use class D, I could be incorrect. Th this person certainly did. Um, and it can't deliver that current. So what you wind up with is when that demand comes in big time, um, you get actually a, a rise in distortion, a dip in voltage, which is worse. You'd, you'd be better off plugging it into the wall because you won't get that as much. All right. So what we do is our power plants are able to handle, I think we can put up to about 80 amps of, of peak current at any one time. And we do that the good old traditional way a big ass power supply with lots of caps and a big power transformer. So you have all this energy storage that can, you know, for a cycle or, for, you know, can put out tremendous amounts of energy, far more than you can get from the wall. Because if you can't do that, then you haven't accomplished anything. So yeah, he, he's right in general. It's all in the execution. Yeah, I love the fact that with the P20, you have these displays that show you what your incoming voltage is, what your outcoming, outgoing voltage is, the line distortion, and so on. I remember uh, before we moved to our current location, we were in another industrial area. And on average, we would get between 137 to 145 volts incoming, yeah. which is crazy. Uh, and then on certain days, we were getting anywhere from 10 to 12% distortion. Wow. Um, I didn't believe it. So I actually had an oscilloscope hooked up to it. And sure enough, because our neighbors were all, you know, industrial units, right? They were doing all kinds of whatever it was they were doing and causing all this noise. It was, it was crazy. It was terrible. I was always in fear of the fact that some of my equipment might blow up because we were getting so much voltage. And anyway. Um, Can I tell you a quick little story about how, those, yeah, of course, please. how, how that got on there? So uh, in, in most of the power plants, the earlier ones, we, we had no such thing. There was no oscilloscope. There was no THD analyzer. And, and you have to admit, it's, I mean, that's not a simple thing to do, to design an entire THD analyzer and put a scope and make it real time. And the reason we did that was uh, years ago, there was a competitor of ours called Richard Gray. Of course, and, yes. Uh, and Dick McCarthy and, and Richard Gray. And they made this, uh, what, God, what do they call it? Not a turbo booster, but a, 
Oh, an electronic flywheel. That's what it was. And it was, it was um, a transformer in parallel. And so when you charge a transformer um, and then you pull the charge off, it kicks back energy. And so their whole contention was, will you hook this up? And then it adds more energy and fixes all these problems. And we looked at it and said, that's complete horseshit. That doesn't do that at all. I mean, it does kick back energy, but it doesn't correct any of these problems. And they were going around telling people, oh, you know, power plants are worthless. Um, you know, this thing lowers distortion by a magnitude. And we're like, and it regulates. And so, I, you know, I told um, our chief engineer, Bob Stadther, I said, look, we gotta got to put a cork in this. And I said, how about this? Let's, because we really are the only ones that consistently can say, we, here's what's coming in and here's what's going out. And let me show you, let me show you that you got 10% coming in and now you're below, you know, you're like 0.01% going on, all that stuff, right? So it's a good marketing tool, but mainly it was, so we could go to a dealer and, and if they had Richard Gray and we could say, all right, great. You believe that? And they all did because Dick McCarthy was one of the best in, in the, you know, and, and bless his heart. He, he believed in the product truly. And it, it, and it did, it was, it did some good stuff. It just didn't do what he said. So we would say, just take the power plant, unplug it from the wall, plug it into the Richard Gray device. And you got a distortion analyzer and you just see what it does. Plug it in straight plug it into the Richard Gray and you tell us. And that quickly ended that story. So anyway, that was, that's why we so, did it. So basically you were responsible for the company's demise. Is that what you say? No, no, <laughs> no. You know what was responsible? Cause they were, they were really, uh, I respected them as a competitor. Uh, Katrina, they were based out of, um, uh, not St. Louis. Uh, where do they have bourbon? New Orleans. Street? New Orleans, thank you. And they were headquartered out of there and Katrina came in and wiped them out. Oh, it was wow. really sad, actually. Um, yeah, it's kind of sad, so. It's amazing how so many companies that, you know, uh, uh, that existed all those years ago, most of them are all, not most, but a lot of them are all gone. Oh yeah, Bedini. Uh, yeah, Counterpoint. Counterpoint. Counterpoint big, know. big success at one time. Great companies. Great yeah. companies. Well, I can't tell you how many times PS Audio almost bit the weenie. I mean, it was. Well, I, that's why I, I said in my introduction, survive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And as you and I were talking earlier, it had nothing to do. You know what it had to do with me? Here's what here's I'm going to take the credit for PS Audio survival. And it survived and thrives because I got out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and I am not kidding you. If, if it, 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 it is. The absolute truth. I, you know, my ego is big enough to believe that I was a good business person. I was a good engineer. I could do all this stuff. And truth is, I'm a terrible business person. And once I, uh, and and blessings to my wife, Terry. Jim Lave. Oh, there, there's Jim Lave, the president of our company right now. Um, once we hired Jim to run the company and we got, uh, you know, our team together and I stepped away and let them run it like a business. We started taking off like a rocket. And now we've got, you know, 53 people in a big building and we're successful and I get the credit for it. And as I told you earlier, the only credit I get is by realizing, you know, Hey, pull your head out of your ass and get out of the way. And that's what I did. So now I, we have great people running the place. And it's not me. <laughs> and, the, well, and the credit goes to them. You know, yeah, I just come up with credit, a good idea once in a while. And that's your it. credit. Yeah, your credit. You you recognize and realize that. Whereas a lot of companies in our industry, because they were started as mom and pop operations, never got past that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. I mean, exactly. Never got past it. And we somehow seem to think that we are really good uh, at everything. And I, I ain't met anybody yet that was that way. I'm sure they exist, but it surely isn't me. 
Well, again, I, I want to be mindful of your time. So last question. Yeah. What else is coming down the pike? Uh, I know uh, you've mentioned about new DACs. You, you, you uh, 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 teased earlier about speakers. Uh, I, I saw the original prototype. What did you call it? The AN1? The um, AN1. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, um, what's coming down the pike? When do you think? And, and yes, I understand this is Paul's time, as, as they call it, Elon's <laughs> time. This is Paul's <laughs> time. <clears throat> I know. Has Elon finished digging under LA yet? I mean, it's uh, <laughs> been waiting for those tunnels. And I, yes. listen, I got to tell well, you, he's got, I, he's I got, he's got the Las Vegas tunnel. It's, it's actually in operation now. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. In the uh, Las Vegas convention. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Oh. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. He's, so, so we know about Elon time. So maybe there's Paul time as well. Right. Paul time is always wrong. <laughs> Um, so we have, uh, Chris is, we, we've got the final prototypes in on, which now call the FR30, the full range 30, which was the AN1, and it's now in his third, fourth, I don't remember, third or fourth iteration, uh, looks wise. It's, it's really, it's, it's cool. It is so cool. We hired Miles Hammond. I don't know if you know him. He's a Canadian, uh, kind of famous Canadian designer. He got in and just, wow, he's an industrial designer and just created the most gorgeous speaker I think I've ever seen. There's four eights on the front, um, two eight-inch pass radiators on each side, a 10-inch ribbon mid-range and a, and a one-inch tweeter up on top. Just gorgeous. Um, so, yeah, that... That will, uh, I'm going to, I will publicly, I, on your channel, I will publicly kill myself if it doesn't come out in, in like October, November. Oh, cool. Yeah. Or maybe I'll kill somebody else. I don't know. I, <laughs> I haven't decided what's going to happen. Uh, yeah. And then from there. What's the anticipated uh, pricing? Uh, it should be like 20 grand for the pair. And then from there, we'll, we're going to do a line of speakers that go, you know, 10 grand, six down to about maybe three or so for the pair um and because we want to we want people to be able to afford these take them home try them and that's a lot where this setup disc comes in because speakers are even worse than electronics you take a pair of speakers home and if you don't set them up right and you don't like them you send them back right so yeah anyway uh new direct stream dac sometime late we would have come out with that earlier but all of a sudden, the chip shortage. Um, we had it designed around the new Xilinx uh, series of big FPGAs, and those are now two-year waiting time. So we've had to scramble, and we found two smaller FPGAs that we can combine into one big one. So we're redesigning the board. And it turned out that was uh, fortuitous because now Ted has even more gates to work with. So he's, he's thrilled. <laughs> Uh, what else? Oh, Octave. And that's coming out when? Um, I, the fall. Let, let's, this let's, is the one that replaces the DS deck. Yeah. And what about the the the, the infamous Obsidian? The, the, the Obsidian crazy. line, we won't see anything from the Obsidian line this year. Okay. I'm hoping for next year. Uh, Miles also designed the whole new look of Obsidian. And oof, I'm... I, I, uh, one of, I guess one of my di disappointments is that I used to just instantly share it with everybody. And I've been restricted uh, and told, do not share this with anyone. So, um, but it, it's cool. It's really cool. And uh, so, yeah, the speakers, Octave, the music server, finally, um, we're playing with it. We've got that will come out with the lower cost version first should be a couple grand um beautiful box and it'll it'll it, it will be a rune a rune endpoint but its main function is to run the program uh, the music management program octave which i'm really excited about but why under octave as opposed to ps audio oh it'll be a ps audio product but what we're using octave uh as the name of the um the program and the name of the of the records, so it's just it's cool. I don't know. <laughs> oh no, I, I thought maybe it was coming out 
under the Octave brand. Oh no, no, no! It's yeah, it's a PS Audio streamer, and but it, the the program itself, uh, Octave, is you know where you can do streaming and play with your library, and that's been nearly five years of wow. software development. Yeah, don't get me going about that. Somebody uh, needs to be fired. Somebody needs to be something. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, totally. And, and what, what is the, uh, what is the expected cost of that? Well, the first one, which will be the octave streamer, which will have no internal hard drive and no ripper, but it will be fully galvanically isolated and all that stuff. And you, you could plug in external drives on the output be about two grand. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it'll be an affordable streamer at the, the bigger one that we've been promising will come out late in this year or early in 2022. And that'll be a, in a perfect way of chassis. That probably is going to be around six grand and it'll be the bigger box with the internal storage and all that. And, and the and last thing have, I would, uh, sorry. Both will have proprietary apps, PS yeah. audio apps. Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. They're, and they'll be free. Uh, we, you know, we, we charge for the hardware and, and the apps are free. Uh, as opposed to the other way that people do it. And the last one, I will uh, the BHK 600. So we've got a 600 watt monoblock beast that's pretty near getting ready for beta. Um, wow. Yeah, so maybe a few more months. So that's kind of cool. I got to sign up for your beta program. One of my clients, he, he, he was kicking me in the butt. Uh, um, uh, um, a shout out to you, Brian. Uh, he says, how come you're not one of the beta testers? And I said, well, we're across the border. It's not so simple. You got to deal with customs and shipping and all this stuff. He says, that's just excuses, man. And he's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should. Get I'll on shoot board. you an email. Yeah, talk, we'll get talk on the to Don. Yeah, yeah I'll, send, I'll shoot you an email. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Is there anything else that, down the pipe that you are able or willing to talk about? <sighs> no. Okay. All right. <laughs> Paul, you've been so generous with your time, and and I I, I wanted to uh, um, thank you for for your contribution to our industry. It's it's been it's been one of my goals to have an archive conversations with um, real leaders of our industry. You know, um, people that have made such a huge contribution in developing and making great products for the rest of us to enjoy. And, and you're certainly one of them. And not only that, you are now an elder statesman. I crown you <laughs> an elder statesman. Can you believe, you know, if somebody had said to you 30 years ago, Paul, you, you're an elder statesman of our industry, you'd go, what? I'm like 40. <laughs> I know, in my head, I'm 35 until I until I look at my, oh my dear God. You can't know, see shit, my glasses, here. can't see yeah. shit. I know. So I just need blurry or glasses. Yep, I I am an elder something. I'm not sure what. <laughs> well, Adrian, thank you so much, and thanks for all you do. I mean, you put out some great videos, and you're one of the the the, the guy. You're one of the good guys that has survived all through this, and thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. So everybody, thank you very much for watching this. Paul, thank you so much for uh, being involved uh, once again. <clears throat> Buy this book. It's still available. The CD is back ordered, unfortunately. But if you continue, if you guys leave comments about the video in the in the comment section, we will pick six, maybe seven, depending on how many we have left of, of these sets, and we'll give them away for free. All you have to do is pay for shipping, and it'll just be whatever the shipping cost is. So if you're in Africa, if you're in Southeast Asia, it's going to cost a bit more. It's not my fault. If you don't want it, we'll, we'll pick somebody else. But make the comment interesting so we will pick you. Uh, Paul, once again, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you after um, traveling is allowed again. And, and we'll come visit the factory and uh, have a listen to your ginormous speakers. It would be our pleasure. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks, Adrian. Take care. Bye-bye. Sure. Bye. Thanks, Paul. That was great. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, Adrian. Good to oh, see your was... face. You haven't you. see that's the trouble with you. You haven't aged with nothing. Oh, you got dark uh, hair. You uh, got no wrinkles. Uh, gray everywhere. Oh, my, 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 don't give me my, any shit about that. Look at the gray everywhere. My, I don't want to hear my, about it. My kids' uh, friends came over uh, just before COVID, right? And one of the guys came up and said, 
hi, uncle. And I'm going, seriously, I, uncle, who's he talking to? Uncle, I, I started to get mad, uncle. <laughs> How old are you now? I'm 55, I think. Oh, yeah. You're looking great, you're looking I, great. So imagine, I met you when I was 20 or 21. Wow. Crazy, God. crazy. Where did time go? I don't know, now I'm 73. Oh, yeah. you look great. Oh, well, yeah. No, no, I, 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 Thanks. Not a, you look great. <laughs> you know, this, besides the fact that you look great, obviously you're all there mentally, which is, is so sad to see a lot of people. They might be, you know, relatively young, but their mind have gone. Yeah. You don't have that. That's great. Yeah, I think a lot of that is just, well, genes, luck, diet, exercise, and staying active and working. I mean, to me, that's, that's uh, of course, I'd just be bored if I didn't, so. And living in Colorado, I guess. Yep, can't, can't hoit. <laughs> All right, well, man. I'm thank gonna... you so much. We'll catch up again. Thanks. All right, buddy.